part of me. I'm just in my kitchen cooking up some breakfast. We've got some sausage. We're scrambling some eggs. But I've got a little secret to share with you. None of this food came from animals. In the past few years, scientists have made huge advancements in alternatives to meats and cheeses. I'm Drew Tuma. Join me as I find ways to fight climate change with my fork. You would think our journey would begin here, but this is an unconventional look at food. So it actually begins here in San Francisco's Mission District. I know it's not the prettiest of buildings, but what's going on inside is pretty amazing. This is the headquarters of Eat Just. They make this, eggs. But these eggs didn't come from a chicken. They came from a plant. Welcome to the Just Plant Library. Here at Eat Just, we've been collecting plants from all over the world. And the goal of that is to identify proteins in plants that we can use to do the same kind of things that people are used to using eggs and dairy for. We have over 100 families of plants in this room, so over a quarter of the families that are known to science. What are you looking for? So we look at things that are rich in protein. Proteins are kind of the workhorses of food science. Do you have a favorite plant? I do, I do. Which one is it? It's right in front of us. Right okay, now. what is this? And this is the mung bean. So the mung bean is kind of the star of our show right now in many ways. Mm -hmm. It's been cultivated for thousands of years in Asia. And it's a seed that we actually found when you remove the skin and you have this yellow inside of the seed here. And we then remove the protein, use that protein for some amazing applications. We built a product called Just Egg mm -hmm that is an egg that tastes and looks and feels just like eggs made from chickens, but it's much more sustainable. Welcome to product development. This is where we take elements of every lab and every other place in the building and actually make the food and the products from it. This is the magic bean that makes all this work. So this is gonna turn into scrambled eggs. Absolutely. Let's do it. The beauty of this is that this cooks just like a regular chicken egg, mm -hmm. and that's the intention. So the function here for this particular mung bean protein in this product is gelation. Essentially, you heat something up and it pulls together, which is exactly the function that you see and a chicken egg have when you scramble it. So you can already see it coming together, building these little curds. And we are just gonna throw these on this plate here. It's fluffy, it looks exactly like a scrambled egg from a chicken. Mm. This is really good, you guys have got something that is very close, if not exactly like an egg. What's up, Drew? Hi, Josh. How you doing, man? So nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Ready for breakfast? Yes. You have all of these breakfast options yes. because your egg that we have tasted is incredible. The mere fact that it came from a bean. That's right. How did you come up with this idea? When you step back and you look at the food system today, it needs a lot of work. It's got to be healthier. It's got to be more sustainable. About a third of the world's ice-free land is being used for one thing, to plant soy and corn for animals to eat. That soy and corn often also comes from clearing rainforests because you need space. There are also lots of runoff issues in our oceans. Let's look at the environmental problem in more detail. Carbon dioxide occurs naturally in nature. It's present in geysers and rivers, but it's also generated by humans. Lots of it is produced by burning fossil fuels. Scientists say that higher concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is leading to warming global temperatures. So what's the effect of food production on our environment? Let's look at this pound of ground beef. It emitted nearly 22 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to get to your kitchen when you take into account the resources needed to raise the cow and then processing and transporting the meat. In contrast, growing and distributing one pound of tomatoes emits less than one third of a pound of carbon dioxide. Like citrus, spinach, tomato. And we talked to Yun Wen Tu. She designs exhibits about food production. Tu created this giant balance to help us visualize the carbon footprint of the food we eat every day. She made cubes of the same size representing two ounces of a specific food. The only difference is the weight of each cube. The more carbon emissions each food generates, the heavier the cube. This is two ounces of feedlot beef. It's very heavy compared with other ingredients. Two ounces of beef is about the size of a McDonald's hamburger patty. Let's say how much other ingredient we can put on the other side to balance it. 
So we have six ounces of salmon, four ounces of pasta, four ounces of spinach, six ounces of broccoli, six ounces of tomato, two ounces of egg, two ounces of orange. We can take it to many different venues and let people actually play with this by themselves. So when they were playing with it, they started thinking about, oh, that's like so different if I eat salmon instead of uh, beef every day. It's naturally led people to think about the alternative diet they can eat. Tu is talking about eating less beef and more fish and vegetables to cut our carbon footprint. But some Bay Area tech companies are looking at other solutions, like beef alternatives. Impossible Foods in Redwood City makes a plant-based burger patty. It sizzles and tastes like beef, but emits nearly 87% less greenhouse gas than a ground beef patty. It also used less land and water to produce. And our secret ingredient is heme. It is a molecule that's in blood. It's a basic building block of life. It's what makes meat meaty, but it's also found in plants. So we make heme from the root nodules of soybean plants. The beef alternative is so popular, it's now a regular menu item at Burger King and regional restaurants like Gott's Roadside. Celebrities are becoming fans too. Singer Katy Perry posted on Instagram that she's going to a plant-based diet during her pregnancy and talked about her love for Impossible Burgers. She's now an investor in the company. I'm going to tell you one thing right now, just choose to eat this too. Comedian Kevin Hart is a fan of Beyond Beef. During a stop at an Oakland school this year, he told students he had only eaten plant-based beef and pork for almost a year. I'm very happy at the change. I'm happy that I'm that I'm going plant-based and I'm happy at the results. You know, I think that my body's uh, is definitely benefiting from it. He then brought in a food truck that serves Beyond Meat hamburgers and sausages so students could try them. I feel like the burger's pretty good. I, I didn't know what to expect, but it's good. I finished the whole thing. Like if my mom was to bring this home or something, I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference if it was real meat or not. The field is wide open now for the food industry. In San Francisco, Endless West is making wine without grapes and sake without rice by scanning the molecular profile of wine spirits. A lot of the traditional processes of, of aging and viticulture require a lot of resources, a lot of time, um, and so we're able to do that in, in much more efficiently because the molecules just come out completely pure and come from the most sustainable and scalable sources. In Brooklyn, Airco is making vodka by capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, turning it into ethanol and then into vodka. The company says each bottle removes one pound of carbon from the atmosphere, the same amount reduced by eight trees. Eat Just is venturing out even further into the realm of science fiction. And what is this in your hands? This is raw chicken meat. And this chicken didn't require killing a single animal, didn't require all that land and all that water and all that soil in the corn. It's required some really brilliant scientists here to say, what if we take a cell, we feed nutrients to the cell, and then we can manufacture meat in the cleanest possible way. Hi. Hi. So we're in the lab here, and this is essentially where conception happens. Yeah, so this is where we start the process. So for us to make cultured meat, we need animal cells, and we just need a tiny bit of them. So we isolate them from the animal, from a biopsy tissue, for instance, mm -hmm. and then we bring them to the lab, and we also have to provide sort of the environment for them to thrive and grow. So essentially mimicking the animal body conditions so that we go from a very small number of cells to a very high number that allow us to make a meat product. So that can be, you know, a chicken bite, it can be a burger, it can be even a more structured product like a chicken breast as well. We find the best tasting chickens, the best tasting cows. Mm -hmm. We get some cells and those cells double and double and double. And then what you have at the end of it is chicken breast. When this is manufactured for mass consumption, it's gonna be manufactured in clean environments that are the highest forms of food safety. Confining lots of animals and eating lots of animals causes lots of issues. I mean, think about the time that we're living in right now. Zoonotic diseases, which are essentially from animal to human, whether that is salmonella or whether that's the coronavirus that we see today, the root of this is the result of a collision between human animals and non-human animals. And that collision just increases the risk of this happening more and more. We need to build a world that you know, is, is less risky in terms of these things getting into the human population.
The cultured chicken is waiting for approval from the federal government before it can be sold to restaurants and eventually supermarkets. Let's head to Petaluma now. This is Miyoko's Creamery. I know, it doesn't look like a farm, but here they are in the forefront of making cheese alternatives. So when people think about vegan cheese, uh, they don't necessarily think it's gonna taste like cheese that comes from a cow. You guys have successfully made it very, very close to that. How'd you guys do this? Our secret is basically that we start from cashews, which are a very creamy nut themselves. And then we develop these really authentic dairy flavors. So this is the first step in the process of making Miyoko's cheese. We start by adding cashews, and then we end up adding cultures and fermenting it. So we end up getting a cultured cashew cheese base. So the cashew is a big part of your product. It's inherently very creamy and a neutral flavor, so it's just a great base to make a cheese out of. This is one of our two aging rooms. So this is where we take our aged cheeses and we leave them here for about three to four weeks. I wish you could smell it in here. It really smells like a delicious cheese in here. One of the things I've always noticed with vegan cheeses before, it's so hard to melt them on grilled cheeses, on pizzas, but somehow you have mastered this. We have mastered the art of melting cheese. And, and we have grilled cheeses here. We've got cheddar and we have pepper jack okay. and these are made out of oats mastered and legumes. It. So this is a whole new technology. They have protein, they have calcium, they've got great flavor. And it has and that like yeah. stretch when you yep. pull it apart that you don't yep. normally see. Maybe not quite as much as dairy cheese, but it does have stretch. It's got that goo factor. It's, it's sort of unctuous, it's fatty, it's rich. Mm. What do you think? This is so rich. Mm -hmm. You really would not know that this was not coming from a cow. Do you have helped to really cut down your footprint on the globe while making this? We did a life cycle analysis and found that our products are up to 98% lower in greenhouse gas emissions. On one acre of land, you can grow enough cashews to make about 6,000 pounds of vegan cheese a year. On one acre of land, with organic cows, you can make 182 pounds of dairy cheese. These sort of premium cheese wheels are made from cashews that are grown in Vietnam. The reason these are so water friendly is because they only grow in tropical climates where rainfall is the only source of water. Okay. So cashews aren't irrigated. So you could say that these actually use zero water, except for what we use for processing here at the facility and cleanup, which is very little. So whether it's land use, water usage or energy inputs. Mm -hmm. These products are 10 to 20 times lower in greenhouse gas emissions than our dairy counterparts. But now you've got to try our new mozzarella, which is on a pizza. As you can see, the melting capability is just mm -hmm. like dairy cheese. Mm. That is so good because pizza is so emotional to people, I feel like. Mm -hmm. They love it, it warms their heart. I think it's been hard to find cheese like this that can melt well, taste great, and that's exactly what that did. It melts perfectly, it tastes like mozzarella. It was so good. Not everyone is ready to give up on animals as a food source. Some, like Albert Strauss, have found a solution. Animals are essential to reversing climate change. The whole movement to get rid of animals is really contrary to the science and the practices that are really gonna save this planet. Strauss is the first zero waste dairy creamery in the world. It relies on old school tech like rotational grazing as well as new technologies. We're also gonna be doing the first commercial trial on red seaweed to reduce the enteric method, not the farts, the belches from cows. Enteric means burps. Cow burps make up one third of methane emissions coming from agriculture in the United States. And methane is a huge problem. It's 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide at heating up the atmosphere. Adding red seaweed to a cow's feed cuts down on nearly 95% of the methane coming from their burps. Strauss is on track to become carbon neutral by the end of next year. For years, his farm has used this methane digester it processes manure from cows to generate electricity, the same electricity that runs the feed truck. He says an easy food solution is to buy local products. We import 50% of our fruit, a third of our vegetables, 10% mm -hmm. of our beef, 80% of our lamb, over 90% of our seafood. Mm -hmm. We're really at risk as a society of not growing our own food. We're shipping products all over the world and it's not sustainable. 
People have the idea that sustainable food is a sacrifice um, of either flavor or amount, but I think it's actually a real opportunity to engage with the way food is grown. Karen Leibowitz owns Mission Chinese Food and other restaurants in San Francisco. She and her husband founded Zero Footprint. It's a movement aimed at restaurants to get their food from farms and ranchers that practice regenerative farming. It creates healthy soil that can absorb carbon from the atmosphere. More than 25 restaurants in California are taking part. If we can use healthy soil practices to draw down CO2, it actually makes our food more nutritious, more delicious, and more resistant to climate change. So we want to create a sea change in the way that we buy and sell food. A study published in 2017 by Project Drawdown looked at solutions to climate change across all industries. 11 of the top 25 solutions to climate change were food related and they were not necessarily more costly. Two of the top three solutions with the most impact included reducing food waste and eating a plant rich diet. The market needs to send a signal that people are interested in this and then farmers will change their practices. We tend to forget where our food is coming from, yet our food choices can help the environment. Start with something simple. Take a moment to think about the impact your food has on the environment as it went from the farm to your plate.